in heaven. I've been, uh, you know, so much looking at the materials about the movies and everything and imagine, I can only imagine and things like this. And I've been thinking about heaven and um, so that's why I'm doing that. Before we go into the message, I will ask uh, Keith to maybe play that little audio. This is an audio files from a book called Imagine Heaven. It's just a little introduction about when we will die, what's going to happen, how, just to get us thinking about uh, how we can imagine heaven. Just imagine that point of life you feared most, the death of your earthly body, suddenly frees you in a way you never anticipated. You feel alive. In fact, so much yourself and so alive that you have to adjust. It takes a little time to realize you're no longer in your earthly body. You still have a body, arms, legs, fingers, and toes, but you begin to realize that something's different as well. It's the same, but different. An upgrade. Imagine, no more aches and pains. In fact, all your senses seem turbocharged and multiplied. You sense and experience in a way that feels more real, more alive than ever before. All anxiety fades into an astounding sense of peace. So many people who fear death are afraid of the pain of death, yet many who describe it don't recall the pain at all. But they do describe what Paul called the peace of God, which transcends all understanding. And I believe that's why he's giving us more and more evidence and insight into the life to come. So we will live for it. Amen. A little uh, preview of what will happen when we will pass from this life to the next one. So how can you imagine uh, heaven? So this morning we want to reflect upon that, that topic. How does imagination work? Well, what's, what's triggering our imaginations? And we will look at a few things. Go to slide number two, just as a way of uh, illustration. You know uh, Marco Polo, you have heard about him uh, in the 13th century. He was the a very great uh, traveler he's from Venice and he went to, to the uh, uh, Genghis Khan and he traveled the world and he wrote and he is a very extraordinary uh, explorer. And when he came back home after his travel, he was describing certain things that he has seen. Like he was describing a black rock that could be set on fire and could provide heat for the people. And his friends could not imagine what he was talking about because they had never heard about charcoal. He told them about a large animal that is about 20 feet long, had a big jaw large enough to swallow someone, but they could not imagine that such an animal existed because they had never seen a crocodile. He told them about a liquid this, uh, substance that came gushing out of the ground and it could catch fire and if you would light it, it would provide a light also. But they could not imagine what it was because they had never heard about crude oil. So when he came back, he was talking about things that people had never seen. Because they had never seen it, they could not imagine and they thought he was crazy. They thought he had lost his, his mind. So how does imagination work? You see, the difference between Marco Polo <coughs> and his friends is that Marco Polo had seen these things. He had experienced it in his life. But the, his friends had not. So they could not imagine, they could not comprehend about that. So imagination, according to research, is impossible is not possible without memory. Let's go to the next slide. That's a little a quote here. Memory feeds imagination. Imagination, according to research, is formed from parts of other things stored in the brain, uh, like uh, events in your past, people uh, learning uh, and experience from your past. They are stored something in your brain and then you can imagine uh, like all sorts of things about these things. I'll give you an example. Imagine if I am going to imagine myself willing, winning the lottery 
at the lottery because I bought a ticket, or winning an uh, Oscar because I would be a great uh, movie star, <laughs> or, uh, or I would be uh, imagining uh, skydiving, okay? Um, somewhere in my brain, some sorts of representation of what lottery ticket is should be stored there. Some sorts of representation of what Oscar is about, movies, uh, Oscars, the statue, and also some representation of what a plane is, uh, what a parachute is, and what skydiving is. So if I'm going to imagine about all of these things, I need to have stored in my brain some at least parts of something that it can trigger uh, imagination. So memory feeds imagination. So if we are going to imagine uh, heaven this morning, let me ask you, what part of that kind of memory is stored in your brain? What part of knowledge or experience of heaven have you already stored in your, li in your life, in your brain? Where does that come from, this imagination? So let us ask ourselves this morning, what our memories is made of? Okay. First of all, our memories is made of our family upbringing. That's where we get most of our memories from. Our culture, the country where we came, the customs of the land, and society, including education and religion. These are the basic uh, things that will be stored in our brain. Memories comes from that, so we, we, it will affect our imagination. But the most important, memories are made of our personal experience, our life, what our life is all about, with a baggage of emotions, bad and good. And research explained that whenever you experience or you remember a past experience, that's very important to, to realize it. When, whenever you remember a past experience, many of these memories are already partially broken. They are partially distorted. They are partially uh, uh, broken by feelings and emotions, like the environment in which you have received these uh, past experience. And the worst of all about our memory, why we have a problem to imagine heaven as a one, the most wonderful place, is that sin has affected our memory. Because of sin, all of our memories, our emotions, our imagination have been distorted. And it explains why it is so hard to imagine heaven. Many of us in this room, even in this room, in our past, we have stored dark, sad, hurtful memories. Things that we would wish that it never happened. And we don't want to think about these things. But these emotions, affects what our imagination will be. In the story that we are going to see next week in the movie, I can only imagine, Bart Miller wrote this. If you suffered a painful childhood, or when you're surrounded by brokenness, it is very hard to imagine a loving father. It is very hard to imagine complete forgiveness. And it is very hard to imagine an eternal home, a happy home in heaven. Because of what you have experienced in your life, it's very hard to connect with this uh, positive imagination of hope. So you and I this morning here, we need to reimagine our future. You need to reimagine your future. And this is why Jesus came. This is what Jesus has allowed us to do. He brought redemption to all of the past experience, to all the brokenness, to all the ugliness of whatever sinful ways, whatever negative things has come, negative emotion. He, Jesus Christ came when he died on the cross. He took our pain, our diseases, our brokenness, our sins, so that we can relearn so that we can relearn to see ourselves through God's eyes. Why did God create you? What is God's plan for you? What has God in store for you and for me? So that we can relearn to see ourselves through God's eyes and we can find peace, we can find safety, we can find purpose, and we can find eternal hope. Another thing that is very important for our imagination in order to imagine what heaven, how heaven is marvelous, is to read the Bible. 
because in the Bible you will see the importance of memory, the transformation of memory, the effect of memory based on the Word of God. Look at Psalm 77, verse 11. David finds confidence because he remembers what God has done for himself and what has God, God has done for his people. And he takes courage and that it affects his imagination. It brings hope into his life. I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember all the wonders you did in the past. I will ponder all your work and meditate on your mighty deeds. Your way, O oh God, is holy. What God is great like our God? You are the God who works wonders. You have made known your might among the peoples. With your strong arm, you redeem your people, the children of Jacob and Joseph. How many times do we read about David being in crisis, being in despair, having no way out, being trapped near death? And then he goes on and we read so many texts like that in the Bible. He remembers what God has done. He looks back at what he knows, what he has stored in his heart and in his brain and in his experience of what God is, what God has done, who God has, has the power to do. And then what it does, it brings hopeful imagination. It brings solutions. It affects his decision and it affects what he's going to do about that crisis. Instead of going to despair, to discouragement, to losing hope, it will create something. It will restore. So, as you and I, we read the Bible, we realize that we are also learning from the memories of other people. When you read the Bible, it's not your story. You're reading the stories of other heroes of faith. You're looking at them, how God intervened for them, what God has done to them, what they are declaring about God, and it builds, it, it builds up a, a, a memory and, and yourself, and it will affect uh, your future. By remembering what God has done, it puts, it puts your past negative experience into the right place, into God's bigger plan. And now you are not a victim of your sad memories, your hurts of the past. You are not a victim anymore because now you can imagine a brighter, a better. You can imagine that God has a plan. You can start to think you have a new perspective. How much God has in store for your future. You know, God knows your sin. And he knows your sin with much details. He knows all about it, all the darkness in our hearts. But the good thing is that God had said that he will not, he choose not to remember our sins no more. Is that because God is losing his memory? No, God keeps his knowledge. He, his knowledge remains. But God puts your past in the right place. He's not going to treat you according to your past. He's going to treat you according to his redemption, his work, and to your life. You are set free from your past through Jesus. And God calls you to put your past in the right place as he has done for you. The, you know, the, the memory is a, is, a strange, is a strange faculty. Uh, the painful memories you will still remember. But the thing is that because now you have Christ's redemption in you, you are no more a victim of your past. Your past is not controlling what your future will, will be. You can imagine now a hopeful and a beautiful future. So how can we imagine heaven this morning? I was thinking about a, a, a parable that you all know from the New Testament in Matthew, uh, the parable of the pearl found in the field. There's a businessman, he's walking through the field and he finds this superb pearl. What does he do with that? He, go, he hides this pearl, he, he sells everything that he has so that he can possess that pearl. The, the, the author of the, the book, Imagine Heaven, says it like this. Many Christians don't live like heaven is a treasure worth selling everything to purchase because we can't imagine just how wonderful it will be. Because we don't have this great imagination about how wonderful heaven is. We don't treat our life right now, our Christian life, as, as is so precious. Jesus says, when he found a valuable pearl, he went away, sold everything he had, 
and he bought it. And this is what we are out to, to be doing. Paul says it like this. This is something to imagine heaven. It's something that no eye has seen, no ear has heard, and no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. So it's hard to imagine something like that. You've not heard about it. You have not seen. You have not been there. But through glimpse of the word of God that builds your memory and what Jesus is teaching and what other prophets have seen and they're describing about heaven, you can see how wonderful it is. Something that the mind has not been able to imagine what God has prepared. Okay, next slide. Let's talk about heaven and let's, let's try to imagine what it is. Heaven will be full of grandeur and beauty. Think about God's creation and the imagination of God the creator. Just, just think about for a moment. And Psalm 19, 1, the heavens, the beauty of creation proclaim the glory of God. You see the, the, the fullness the riches, the beauty, the glory of nature, and you see something of the character of the Creator. The skies display His craftsmanship. The multitudes of species, of seeds, of plants, of insects, of animals, the complexity and the marvels of the human body, the five senses, just, just think about your body, your five senses. I touch, I feel, I smell, I, I, I can communicate with you. The brain functions, the eyes. You know, scientists are searching the, the brain. They are trying to discover how the brain functions, the nervous system, the purification of the blood. And the, the list goes on and on. The, the millions and millions of cells in the human body that, that gets renewed and you know all the cycle of life and these kind of things and this is only an earthly description that we're talking about when we look at the human body and the human and the, and the creation can you try to Im imagine just for a moment just stop for a time try to imagine the dimension where god dwells we just described the, the marvels of this earthly body with our limitations and the nature the, on, on the earth. Imagine where God dwells. Bring a little magic into your uh, uh, imagination. Uh, uh, maybe magic is not the right word, like uh, fantasy or uh, cre creativity or some sort of things like that. The Bible describes mountains, valleys, rivers, beauty similar to those that we see on earth when they describe heaven, but multiplied by their effects with uh, vibrant new colors that comes from God being the light of that place. You know, there will be no sun and moon and the new earth and the new heavens. God will be the light, the glory of God. It's really wonderful. And the, the person who, who wrote this book, um, the Imagine Heaven, has also studied the testimonies of 1,000, what we kill, people who went to near death experience. People who, who died or were, were clinically dead, what they saw when they came back. So he studied many of them. And he, 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 he tried to compare the, the t descriptions that they brought with the text and to, to make it compatible, to, to see if it, it fits with the descriptions of what the Bible is saying. So many of them describe uh, sensory explosions of vivid colors, captivating, more captivating than the northern lights, you know, like when the sky is all moving with all the lights. And then uh, the blind people who had this kind of experience declare that they could see the light of God and that he could feel a, a love, like a kind of love, a dimension of love that nobody has ever experienced that. The, the, the greatest moment of love in that. 
If you look at some of the texts uh, quoted there, Revelation 7, 27, the shepherd will guide us to springs of living water. The spirit uh, took me to the high mountain and he showed me. I don't know if you have ever climbed on very high mountain looking through the valleys and things like that. It's so majestic to see these kind of things. But the text that attracted me uh, this week was uh, Ezekiel chapter 1. When he describes the, when God called Ezekiel, he described all the supernatural experience that he ex experienced. He saw God's throne, all sorts of strange uh, beings like cherubims and seraphims, lightnings, brilliant lights, uh, four living creatures, and he tried to describe it and it just doesn't make sense to us because in our imagination we have never stored in our brain these things. He, he saw it in a, in, a, in a vision, so he's trying to describe it with his own words. That's why sometimes you see something like, oh, I'm speechless, I don't have enough words to describe what I want to describe, you know, something like that. And he saw something like a dome, like a horizon, uh, made of dazzling crystal, a throne made of sapphire. And then in verse 27 that I quoted here, he talks about the one sitting, he's describing the being sitting on that throne, the upper body and the lower body. And this is the lower body. The figure seemed to be shining like bronze in the middle of a fire. It shone all over with a bright light and had it all the colors of the rainbow. Like the, you know, sometimes we, we only know certain colors. Maybe Brother Chris is, can, can uh, uh, appreciate this. We only are limited with certain colors, but in heaven we will discover colors, shades of colors that we don't even know uh, exist. And it is like uh, you have, uh, uh, all of these things are the colors of rainbow. This was the dazzling light which showed the presence of the Lord. So it will be a, a dimension, things that we cannot at the moment imagine clearly because it has not been stored in our brain. But these memories that are transmitted to us through the Bible help us to cultivate, to grow and expand our memory. You know, when Jesus told, told these parables, like the parable of the, the pearl and the, uh, and, and, the, and the field, isn't it something that he, he grows and he expands our imagination? He gives us a story. Why does Jesus give us a story like that? A man is walking and a field. Okay, so what about this? It's just a field. But he finds a pearl. And this pearl is so special, it's so precious, it's so beautiful that he, he, he wants it so much that he will sell everything else. So you see the effect, the direct effect of imagination on the actions and the decision of this man. He sees these pr precious treasures, he wants it so much that it will affect. Have you ever sold everything that you have to get something else that you want? Probably not. Probably not. But this is how heaven is described to us. This is, this is what God wants us to know. This is what God wants us to imagine this morning, that heaven will become so real, so beautiful, that we could be the person that will change our lifestyle. It will change our service. It will change our love. It will change our relationship. It will change our decision making. It will affect everything about our life. See, amen to that. It's a good thought. Amen. Slide number six. Who will be in heaven? What is going to happen in heaven? Heaven will begin with a magnificent welcome party. We'll call it the, the wedding of the Lamb. A glorious reunion of friends with Jesus Christ will be a very, very elaborate wedding feast. Amen. And then you see it in this text here, you have come to the city of the living God, countless thousands of angels, and joyful gathering. So sometimes, I don't know why we're like this, but sometimes I think many Christians think that heaven will be boring. And maybe it is right that they think like that because what is stored in their memory is maybe only church. It's only religion. If it's only church and, and religion that is stored in our brain to, to um, uh, 
create an imagination of heaven, it will sound boring, isn't it? But this is not what we read here. It says like myriads and myriads of angels and joyful gathering. So I can imagine, okay, joyful gathering. Okay, uh, the last uh, holiday that we had, the Dragon Boat Festival. This is a very imperfect uh, illustration. We had lovely sisters who visited our home. It was holiday, we were relaxed, there was no work, we had great food, we played games, we had fun. That is like, like it, it's an imperfect illustration. But think of heaven and going in that direction. There will be no sin in heaven. There will be no curse in heaven. There will be no sinful, hurtful anything. All you will have there is your best friends. Is it boring to be with your best friends, playing games, having fun, going out? It's good. So in heaven, this is going to be like that. Your beloved, the most loving, pleasant experience will be there. Think about it. Imagine, reimagine heaven like you've never done before. The assembly of God's firstborn. This is the church. Believers who I believe in Jesus because our names have been written in heaven. Amen? Yeah. Is your name written there? So we are there. We have come to God himself. God is there. And he is the judge of everything. So there is no more judgment for you. Once you are there, you are okay. You made it. So make sure you make it there. You have come to the spirits of the righteous ones in heaven who have not been made perfect. The Old Testament people through their redemption in Christ Jesus have been made righteous and perfect and you have come to Jesus. This is the, describing the citizens in heaven. We are having a good time. Next slide. Our friendship, our relationship will be richer. Whatever we consider joy here, a joyful experience, will be million times multiplied. You remember any Good, joyful, fun, the most pleasant experience. Have you ever been in a place where you wish this moment will last forever? Yes. If you have been madly in love sometimes, maybe you have had some stored memories of that at some point. I wish this moment will last forever or something like that. <clears throat> so it will be multiplied so many times, the joy of having that. Amen? There will be no sin, no sinful, no proud and hurtful behavior. And um, it says, I think, nothing evil will be allowed there. Think about it. Nothing, nothing evil, <coughs> not a, even a little feeling. What would it be like? <coughs> what would our emotions or feelings be if nothing evil, <coughs> no mention, nothing at all, not a glimpse, not a mention, not a thought, no, nothing. <coughs> Thank you, my dear. <laughs> I wish this moment will last forever. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. Our relationship in heaven will be perfect. You know, many marriage now, we have promised to love, cherish, make each other happy, be faithful until death, things like that. You know, to think about others, to honor, to respect others. And we break our vows all the time. But in heaven, there will be nothing evil. These perfect marriage vows will be lived perfectly. There will be no anger, no frustrations, no tensions, no disagreement, no, no competitions, no tensions and, and the relationship because no sin will be there. It's hard to imagine. I'm telling you it's hard to imagine. <laughs> but we need to try to imagine it because this is how we will enjoy thinking about heaven. No misunderstanding, no jealousy. In heaven there will be none of that. Our relationship will be open. How many of you have little secret that you wish nobody will know about? <laughs> In heaven, no need to hide. No need to hide anything. There will be no judgment. Imagine no judgment. 
You can see anything. Because anything you will see will be good. It will be true. It will be pure. It will be honest. So, so there will be no judgment. There will be no regret. Wow. I'm getting excited. I'm more excited than when I was preparing my sermon. Wow. It will be so wonderful. You know, conversation sometimes is boring. Eh? And having a conversation will be intelligent. <laughs> Think about that. It will make sense. It will be interesting. You know, you know so a young couple, when they are courting each other, they always want to talk. They text, they call, they Skype, they do everything. There's not enough time. When they get married, they stop talking to each other. <laughs> because they think, they think it's not going to be interesting anymore. Is that right? And heaven, think about it, our conversation will be interesting. It will, I don't know if you like about football, you can talk about football or anything that you can talk about, it will be interesting. Well, that's great. And it will be loving. You know, sometimes we don't know how to listen to others. We want to be listened to, but we don't listen to others, and heaven will be that. Nothing will be complicated by sin. There will not be that. Now, in this life, Jesus is allowing us to be put to test. I want to pronounce one word, which is very important, and this particular life is forgiveness. Why do we struggle so much with forgiveness? It's because we need to be prepared for the life to there. And I was thinking about it. If there is no evil, there is no sin, there is no hurtful behavior, what about forgiving others now? Things that have been done to us maybe last year, five years ago, two weeks ago. Someone talked against us, someone doesn't like us. And we are being heard by them. And Jesus tells us that we need to bear with each other's grievances. That we need to forgive like he, Christ has forgiven us. And then we decide, I am not forgiving that person. <laughs> that, you laugh about it, but that's very serious. Because can you imagine the result when Jesus said in the Beatitudes if you don't forgive your Heavenly Father will not forgive you the dramatic realistic application to that if you refuse to forgive right now when God gives you a test to do it so that you can enter it and live at that level there in that dimension of love can you imagine if you refuse to forgive what it will do to you? Think about it. Never refuse to forgive after you hear me talk this morning. Luke 16, 9 says, I'm telling you that wealth is often used in this honest way, in this life. But you, today, should use wealth, your money, to make friends for yourself. Like, use your money to, to share the gospel, to do something, to help the poor, to lead them to Christ. Because when life is over, you will be welcome into an eternal home. So there will be friends in heaven. There will be friends there waiting for you. There will be friends that will be in heaven because of you. That's what this text is all about. We will be in close fellowship with God, the angels, and people. Can you imagine? You will be best friends with people you have never met, people you only read about in the Bible. You will be best friends. Eh? You, I see in your eyes that some of you don't believe me. <laughs> but it is true. You will be best friends in heaven because there will only be best friends. There's no sin. There's no uh, classes of people. There's no prejudice. Oh, uh, there's no exclusivity. You all, you, only three of you are my friends. You four are not my friends. Get away from me. It's not going to happen in heaven. It's not going to be there. Amen? Amen. Love is the point. Okay, let's go to the next point. There will be work in heaven. Oh, no. I want to do my re retirement. No, there will be work in heaven. We will have projects. There will be music to write. 
there will be work to do without the frustration of the sinful behavior of this world. There will be no longer curse. There will be no longer any curse. Remember after Genesis chapter 3? There was a curse on work, a curse on the land, a curse on the relationship between men and women, a curse about working hard with sweat until we will die and return to dust. It's finished. And heaven, the, the work, when you hear the word work in that dimension, it's not the same as the work here. It's not the same. Look at Adam and Eve when they were tilting the land and the Garden of Eden. Was it painful? It was perfect. Nature was perfect. Sin was not there. You know, some people, they like gardening. It's an interesting hobby. Some people are crazy about certain types of hobbies. Well, multiply that by millions of times. The greatest interest, things that you love to do, things that you like to learn, things that you like to touch, things that you like to experience, it will be work in heaven. It will be really, really, really wonderful. Music, creativity, dance, art, culture, without perversion, without human pride, without selling for a ticket or something like that. All of the work in heaven will reflect God's glory. We will have property. We will have valuables. There will be animals to care for. We will have assigned roles and responsibilities. Look at these verses. We will reign forever. And Jesus says, I will put you in charge of ten cities. There will be some rewards there like that in heaven. All of us will be serving to the fullest capacities, the, the gifts that God has given to each one of us. Everything will be multiplied. You will be intelligent. You will make the right choices. You will be talented. You will do everything right. No need to tear up the paper, start all over again. Everything will be perfect the way we work. Say amen to that. All we will have unique work and it will bring great enjoyment. It will be wonderful. I give you a, a, again an imperfect illustration. I remember working in the Rocky Mountains of Canada, in the high mountains, like, uh, and being in beautiful sites that just like make your mind blow out. You know, just like it's too beautiful to, it's just like uh, wonderful. So it's like you would work in, in like, like this mindset. You know, I have worked before also in orchard, you know, uh, gathering fruits and things like that. So, so it's, it's exciting. You, you gather, you harvest, you, uh, you reap something. And I remember a, a traditions we have in Quebec, in Canada, where I live. It's uh, in springtime when we collect uh, maple water to make maple syrup. It is a traditional uh, time for family gatherings. We go to the forest, we have a maple shack, cousins, nephews, uncles, aunties, mother, father, son, grandchildren, everybody is there. And we eat and we laugh and we catch up together. And then we take buckets and we go for a run in the forest and we collect from the tree the water, put it in the buckets, bring it to the horse or to the tractors. And it's work, but it's not work. It's fun. We just talk and laugh. Even children participate. It's just, it, it's an imperfect illustration. But it's just to illustrate that work in heaven will be fun, pleasant, uh, meaningful, interesting, something you want to do, not something you are forced to do, not something you are oppressed to do, something that you will want to do, and something that will be eternal in value. Amen. Hallelujah. There will be rewards in heaven. Uh, we have uh, these texts here. And their, for their good deeds will follow them. Invite people to the banquet in your home and you will be rewarded in heaven. Our labor is not in vain. There will be a resurrection. So, so all of these things are, are wonderful truths that we need to, to realize. This decaying world this world that makes a veil before our eyes and where our dark memories blind us from imagining 
the beauty and the glory of heaven. This decaying world will be replaced at the end of time by the new heaven and the new dwelling place. Amen? Amen. If you look at the next slide quickly, heaven is a perfect place. You know, when John described heaven, he described it by saying things that will not be there. Because these things that will not be there are the things that will make heaven a perfect place. There will be no sea. The sea will be not there anymore. Uh, why is that? Because imagine John was on an island. He was a prisoner in an island. And he was separated by the water from the people he loved, from the church, from gathering with other Christians. He was isolated. There would be no more sea. Sea is what separates us, the islands and the people and the continents and things. There will be no more separation from our loved ones, things like that. Time will still exist. You know, the, the people before the throne of God in heaven are asking, Lord, how long before you will exercise your justice against those who killed us? Like faithful Christians have been martyred. They are in heaven. They are aware. A time exists. It says, how long before you judge? Awareness of what's happening. They still have questions and they will receive answers. So there's, there's things that will happen. There will still be things that we will learn in heaven about glory and about, you know, wonderful. It will be a wonderful place. Your real you, you, the real you will live in heaven. Not a ghost, not a, like a, some sort of a spirit of you, but the real you. Jesus says, I'm not a ghost. Touch me. I have flesh and bones after he was risen from the dead. What, uh, we heard it in the audio uh, at the beginning of the sermon. What our bodies will eventually be is a super upgrade to a glorious body. Heaven is a perfect place. There will be no more tears. It's also a physical place. It is described exactly like with materials. There will be pearls, precious stones lay at the foundations. It will be so pure that it would look like crystal gold will be there. There will be colors we have never seen or even thought of when we get to heaven. It would be amazing. The great city was a pure gold. It's more beautiful than we can imagine. Now, who will enter to heaven? Who will enter to heaven? The only ones who will enter are those whose names are written down in the book of life. So make sure that your name is written in the book of life. Make sure that the people you care for are written down in the book of life. And all the people who do not know Jesus must have their names written in the book of life. Look to uh, slide number 10. Meanwhile, we groan now, longing to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling. For while we are in this tent, we groan, we are burdened. It is, this is now and this earthly life. Because we do not wish to be unclothed, we don't want to die. We, like we heard in the audio this, this morning, we, we are afraid of the pain of dying, what it will do to us. We do not wish to be unclothed, but we wish to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling. And look at the last part, how wonderful it is. So what is mortal will be swallowed up in life. If you believe in Jesus Christ, you don't actually die. It, your mortal dimensions, your more living, is swallowed up in another dimension, the glory of God. It's never too late to prepare for eternity. Amen? Amen. Look at slide number 11 and we finish with that. This morning, reimagine how heaven will be. Let your sanctified imagination based on the this, on this scriptures. Use your memory of scriptures describing God's rich, extravagant creativity, God's extravagant love, God's extravagant glory. And look at all the glimpses of descriptions of heaven that you can get from different prophets and revelations and different texts from the Bible, anything that describes the life to come. 
just get these glimpses, put them all together, and imagine and uh, reimagine how heaven will be. C.S. Lewis, a great Christian writer, says if you read history, you will find that the Christians who did most, the most efficient, they, they, they changed the world. But the, the greatest things did the most for this present world were just those who taught most of the next. The more you imagine heaven, the more you, heaven is precious like the precious pearl that we have talked about, the more you will want to do to make it significant that your life will count because in this life right now you are preparing for the life to come. So your imagination is already, you know, going full speed or thinking about these things. You know, that's, that's why I came to mission. That's why I left my country to go as a missionary to another land. That's exactly that thought that came into my mind. You know what motivated me a lot? I told myself at the time, if Jesus would return in three years, I, that's how I, I did it in that time. I've been here 27 years almost, but at that time before I left, I said, well, if Jesus would return in three years, where would I want to be? What would, I, what would I want to be found doing? And that gives me the strength to sell the house and to leave everything and to take my family with me and to come here. Without that imagination of heaven, I could not have done that. I could not, I tell you I could not. My, my, my faith would not have been powerful enough. So I want to urge you this morning, look at the last, last slide. It's the words of the song, I can only imagine that this movie is all about the life of the writer, the movie's about. But look at this, surrounded by your glory, what will my heart feel? Will I dance for you, Jesus, or in awe of you be still? Will I stand in your presence, or to my knees will I fall? Will I sing hallelujah? Will I be able to speak at all? I can only imagine. Father God, we close this morning. Open our imagination to the beautiful truths that we find, the glimpse of truth, the testimonies of Old Testament saints and the prophets and the words of Jesus and the words of your apostles. John and Paul and the descriptions. Lord, heaven will be so wonderful. Lord, may this discovery of heaven, this imagination of heaven, change everything in my life. And Lord, I pray for everyone in this room this morning. If anyone has not yet been born again, has not yet given their life to Jesus, has not yet been redeemed by faith in the death of Jesus Christ on the cross, washed by the blood of Jesus Christ, believing in the resurrection of Jesus Christ as, as the proof of our own resurrection. If anyone in this room have not yet, it means that their names have not yet been written down in the book of life. Lord, I pray that your love will pull them in that they will feel the, your love that they will experience because in heaven we will experience a love a dimension of love like we have never experienced before heaven will be more beautiful than we could ever imagine it's a perfect place it's a physical place with god it's it's a place of, of glory of, of beauty of, of love of friendship of uh, enjoyment for eternity with our god and it is all because of what jesus has done on the cross thank you father Thank you for touching our lives today and changing the way we see our future. There is no guilt, no condemnations, no broken emotions that will uh, determine how we live in this life. But this imagination of heaven will change our decisions and will change our future lifestyle. If all for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 God bless you.